Welcome to Otter Creek Online. In just a few minutes, you're joining us virtually for our worship experience, but before we do that, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that some of you joining us each week online are longtime members of the Otter Creek family, and some of you are new to this online Otter Creek experience. You may even be watching from a different state today. We want you to know that our leadership team has a strong desire to know who you are. We want to know what you care about. We want to know what you're interested in spiritually. We want you to know that we want to know how we can help you grow. So here's what we want you to do very practically. If you're watching live through YouTube or Facebook, would you put something in the comment section telling us how we can reach out to you? We have a lot of ways of knowing metrics, but we don't know who you are in the online community. If you're not watching live, you're watching later in the week, would you send an email to our community life minister, james at ottercreek.org? He will get back with you. But our desire, just like with our Brentwood campus and our West End campus, our desire is to know who we're serving and how we can serve you better in the weeks to come. Thanks for joining us online, and we hope to hear from you soon. Good morning, Otter Creek. One more time. Good morning, Otter Creek. Good morning. All right. It's great to see each and every one of you. We want to welcome all of you that are joining us in person and online. We are thankful for your presence with us this morning because we know you could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here with us. Also, we have some service opportunities coming up here at Otter Creek. Our first fall festival will be at the end of this month on October the 30th, and we request and ask and encourage everyone, please, Sponsor a trunk or bring some chili. We're having a chili cook-off this year. It's the battle for the golden ladle. So please, if you would to go, when you're outside in our uh, lobby, in the gathering area, we have some QR codes on our TVs and on the tables that you can sign up for our trunk or you can sign up for chili. Also, we have, an, uh, in December, we have Lessons and Carols. It's coming back. It's been gone for two years due to the pandemic, but we are bringing Lessons and Carols back. And Lee Flat will be leading a choir this year. Anybody interested in singing in that choir for Lessons and Carols, see Lee Camp this morning, 10 a.m., in room 157 for the first rehearsal and to talk to him about that. Lee Flat, Lee Flat, thank you. I said the wrong name again. <laughs> also, you see me, you know what that means. It's New Member Sunday. So let's talk about our new families that have joined Otter Creek this month. First up will be Abel, Abigail and Nicholas Simpson. They attend the Otter Creek West End campus. They both met at Harding University. And Abigail is from Memphis and works, in public works for a public relations company. And Nicholas is originally from Louisiana. He was a theology major at Harding and is currently working on his master's in speech language pathology. Next up was Craig and Julie Underwood. The Underwoods moved back to Nashville in May of 2020, and they are the parents of Nate and Ben Underwood and Katie Pate. And let's welcome our new members here to Otter Creek. We're so thankful to have them here with us now to be a part of our family. And this morning we have a special treat for you also. This morning we have um, Sanctuary, which is Lipscomb University's premier a cappella vocal ensemble. They are with us here to lead us in praise and worship this morning. And they are also under the direction of our very own Randy Gill. So give them a hand. Let's stand and sing together. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, the nations rise and fall, kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. Justice you will reign. 
to you, my God and King, I will continually bless your name forever and always. My praise will never cease. I will praise you every day. I will lift up your name forever. The eternal is great and deserves endless praise. His greatness knows no limit, recognizes no boundary. No one can measure or comprehend his magnificence. One generation after another will celebrate your great works. They will pass on the story of your powerful acts to their children. Your majesty and glorious splendor have captivated me. I will meditate on your wonders, sing songs of your worth. We confess there is nothing greater than you, God, nothing mightier than your awesome works. I will tell of your greatness as long as I have breath. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done
Just in case, it's become so subtle the, uh, since we don't pass collection plates anymore. This is the offering time. Um, and there will be ways to give on the screen. But I, I hope you've appreciated that we've used this time as a church to highlight some of the ministries that you're giving support. And I'm here to talk about um, Room in the Inn, which I know many of us are aware of. Some are more involved than others, but it starts up here in November, runs through uh, March. So I... Um, used to feel kind of guilty on Tuesday nights because I would always sign up for the overnight shift. Not because I'm some sort of saint, because if you're a non-details-oriented person, it's the easiest thing you can do. You show up and you sleep, and then you wake up and see the guys off. Um, I felt bad because I was often leaving Mariah with the kids to put them to bed, even though you don't have to come till 8 o'clock, but anyway... And then last year, our oldest decided he wanted to come along because, I mean, what could be better? It's like a church lock-in in the middle of the week. And I, I was a little nervous because, um, you know, I mean, we get the guys up before 5 o'clock to get them out the door by 6. I wasn't sure he'd be rested enough, but Turner was great. Anyway, the first night we show up um, and um, we, you know, there's this beautiful moment when you show up, they're cleaning up from dinner. There's some guys who are already bedded down for the night and snoring away. And some guys going through the closet looking for maybe some shoes that'll fit a few guys wrapping up showers. There's always one or two who clearly need to chat. And, um, and sometimes those chats are funnier than others. But this night, um, there's a guy we met uh, who, like my son, Turner, also goes by T. Uh, and his name's Theatry Branch. And um, so we, there is his picture. Uh, oh, man. So, uh, Theatry, I didn't realize that at the time, had just gotten out of prison, which is not that uncommon. And um, he really wanted to talk. The beauty of having an eight-year-old with you is he kind of gets into mentor mode. You know, man, don't follow this path. And boy, you're so lucky to have your family that you're together with. And boy, he was really distraught about just the, not having the connection with his family any longer in Mississippi. And um, so we, we kind of stayed in touch, and I'd get a message from him every once in a while on Facebook. Hey, how's the other T doing? I'm like, oh, he's doing great in school. Anyway, and uh, through this relationship, we as a church were able to help T go see his family, hop a Greyhound bus and, and go start the reconnection. And then help him go back again. And then we, he, he went back again, and he didn't come back here to Nashville, which I wasn't sure was a great idea. But now he's reconnected. He's taken care of his 77-year-old mom. He's reconnected. That This is his granddaughter, and this was the first time he'd ever met her. Um, and he was so worried that she wouldn't 
care or know him, and it was a beautiful time. I'm not saying things are all worked out for him, you know, and T needs a bunch of help still. Um, uh, but he's there wor- working, roofing, and working in restaurants, and he really traces this reconnection, reconciliation with his family back to a night he slept on the floor of our gym, but received some hospitality and a connection with a church that could help him. I don't know about you, but I am not often in the midst of people who could desperately use my help to just sustain their basic human needs. And that is the beauty of Room in the End, that it puts us in the midst so we can do the Lord's work. And praise be to God that we can get out of the way and great things will happen. I'm not saying there's always a beautiful story and then there are not sometimes annoying things that happen, but I would encourage you to sign up to help with Room in the Inn in the way that works for you. I checked the sign-up list last night. There are some openings uh, for overnight, for dinner, for bringing breakfast by, for preparing lunches, for driving the van, which is a great shift. You should do that. Um, so join me in prayer. Lord, help us to mean it when we say that all we have is, is yours, our time, our money, our lives, and bless all that we give to give glory, not to us, not to our church, but to you. And so in your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning, Otter Creek. Oh, man. You know what this means. It's fall break. (laughs) So you get Uncle Pat. He's going to come and give you a sermon, and it's going to be great. So I know this year, I think last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, fall breaks were like all on the same week. Is that right? So this, this is the time where it was on different weeks. And um, I'm just excited to be back with you. So hello to those of you who are watching us online. It's so great um, to be with you. And it's so great to be back in on the Brentwood campus. Um, If you're brand new to Otter Creek, you're like, who is this handsome man? And where have they been hiding him? Well, I'm in hiding at OC West End. Uh, That's where I'm at most of the time uh, when I'm not here with you uh, at the Brentwood campus. But uh, if you've not been able to join us at the West End campus at 10 a.m., I encourage you to do so. We would love to have you. We have things happening during the week that you could also come be a part of. Just consider coming to hang out with us. If you're online watching, um, I'm sure that all of you who are at the beach right now are tuned in at the 840. I know it. We're checking rolls, so don't worry about that. So uh, this morning... Uh, I'm going to continue this series of the uh, seven deadly sins that Josh has been um, unpacking for us over the past several weeks, uh, or seven pathways, or um, um, another way to think about these sins is that there aren't these passive things, right? These are, these are sins that can really do harm and damage and destruction in our lives, and so I have the honor of talking, I guess honor may be the wrong word, but... I'm going to be talking about sloth. And so um, I think I have some, I think this is, nope, that's the wrong sloth. That is not the right sloth. No, I think this is, that. no, that is not, definitely not that sloth. We could, that could be a good sermon, but not that sloth either. No, no, not again. That is, that would be a great sloth to talk about, but this is not that sermon. I think the last, okay, that's more yes. Yes, this is the thing we're a little ancient picture here. This is the sloth we're going to be getting into uh, this morning uh, as we talk about this sin of sloth or, or some has, has called it acedia. And so I want to start this morning with this quote from Anne Lamott. Many of you have read Anne Lamott's work, but I think this is a great way for us to start this sermon. It says, the secret 
is that God loves us exactly the way we are and that he loves us too much to let us stay like this. That's how much God loves us. Loves us so much, exactly where we are, but it's like I love you so much that I can't simply let you stay like this. Now, I know when you hear, when you were looking at the email uh, this week, um, if you're not on the email list, get on the email list. But if you're looking at the email list this week, you're like, oh, Patrick's going to be talking about sloth. How nice. That, good for him. That's, that seems like an easy one. Uh, good job, Patrick. You draw a good straw. But you know what, Patrick? That's not really one that I am going to be struggling with. Not me, If I showed you my life, sloth is definitely not something that I am struggling with. Well, friend, I kind of have some news for you. Uh, This sin is actually something that comes for us all. And this is going to be, I'm going to take us to some places, so bear with me. It's going to feel like I'm coming at you. I kind of am, but I'm coming at myself, too with this particular teaching. You see, according to many of our desert fathers and mothers, they say this, that beyond the laziness, beyond the apathy, beyond the lack of care, that this sin of sloth, the city of busyness and workaholism aren't necessarily virtuous, but rather sloths, classic symptoms. You heard that right, friends. Busyness and even workaholism. You know, first identified as the noonday demon in the monastic life, it was later said that this was, um, that ascidia was the root sin of sloth. This is said by folks like Thomas Aquinas and others. See, early church mothers and fathers considered this sin to be a state of restlessness and an inability to pray or to work. It has been said that monks have said that this particular sin is the most burdensome of all of the demons which can make the sun appear to slow down or stop or for the day to seem 50 hours long. I know that some of you can truly relate to that. Who hasn't felt the paralyzing inactivity in their own prayer and spiritual life. Many of you have lived long enough to have experienced this kind of season that's mixed with restlessness and a desire to flee, not being able to find any consolation. Who here this morning hasn't nursed old wounds or resentment during the very moment that you want nothing more than a lot of the time to liberate yourself from your sinful ways. Even more so, some of you have wanted to abandon prayer altogether, forsake your work, your vocation, and to leave all responsibilities behind. Now, I'm not going to ask you all to stand up if that is you this morning, but as I was preparing this, I definitely could find myself in one of these states in my life. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this particular sin. We have this verse in Proverbs 19 that says, slothfulness cast into a deep sleep And an idle person will suffer hunger. And I would say it's beyond just physical hunger, but it's also spiritual hunger. Or this Proverbs 19, 24, the lazy man buries his hands in the food dish, but will not bring it to his mouth again. Now that's some laziness, right? I couldn't imagine not picking up a rib and putting it to my mouth. Or I had, actually last night I had some okra from Captain D's. If you've not had okra from Captain D's yet, folks, you're missing out. Maybe you need to go to Captain D's today. I don't know. 
Or perhaps this verse from Hebrews 6 where it says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and practice inherit the promises. And then, of course, we have the classic passage of Matthew 25, which I'm sure as you thought about this particular sin, this is the passage that you landed on. It talks about the talents. It says, he who has received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you were to be a, a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should receive what was my own with interest. So let me take that talent away from you and give it to the one that has 10 talents. For everyone who has will, will uh, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what you have will be taken away. So this sin of sloth, it really does disguise itself in many different ways and many different masks. And the Greek word for this particular word, acid, it literally means lack of care. In this way, it threatens one's fundamental commitment to God and one's religious identity and vocation. You see, this is a serious temptation because it's a temptation to leave the spiritual path, to turn away from one's commitment to God and the practices that, in, that encourages this. Another way to put it is that this sin of sloth says, I don't care. But not only to say, I don't care, it says, I don't care about the things of God. And that's a tough realization to have when it comes to this sin. Because there are many of you who say, I've never been there just yet. But some of you, it's like, this is really speaking to me at my core about the thing that I've been struggling with and I've been struggling to name it. And my challenge is, as with any of these sins, before we start imagining the people that this sin is connected to, that we first do the internal work of like, how have I been in this particular space? Frederick Buechner had this wonderful quote that I still am wrestling with as I read it a few weeks ago. It says this, sloth is not to be confused with laziness, which is what we often want to do. He says, lazy people who sit around and watch the grass grow may be people at peace. Their sun-drenched bumblebee dreaming may be prelude to action or itself an act well worth the acting. So you see, sometimes with this particular sin, we want to look at what is happening on the outside. Well, this person is running around. Their calendar's full. They're super busy, they're super active. But that guy over there, he's, what, he's just hanging out? He's taking a nap? He's watching the grass grow? That could be a person at peace who has got a different kind of motivation as to why they're at peace in that moment. And one day we will finally jump over the fence of understanding that this life is, yes, your actions, I can look at them and I can tell of certain things about you. But what is truly the journey is, what is your motivation for the actions that you're doing? 
So sometimes you could just be a person of peace or the person that we watch is a person of peace. He goes on to say, slothful people, on the other hand, may be very busy people. They are people who go through the motions, uh uh-oh, who fly on autopilot like someone with a bad head cold. They have mostly lost their sense of taste and smell, and it's not COVID. They know something's wrong with them, but not wrong enough to do anything about. Other people come and go, but they, through glazed eyes, they hardly notice them. They're letting things run their course. They're getting through their lives. How many times have you sat in front of a friend, you sat in front of a neighbor, you sat in front of a family member, and it says, how's life going? You say, I'm super busy, but are we truly busy doing the things that God would have us do? Are we committed to the things that God would have us committed ourselves to? This sin not only leaves the life of prayer and reading scripture behind, but it also is leaving the spiritual community. And if you need me to translate that a different way, that says leaving the church. That's what the sin of sloth will take you to. Yes, it's linked to both laziness and busyness, but sloth is avoiding to undergo the process of spiritual transformation, neglecting one's spiritual disciplines, and occupying oneself with other pursuits. In this way, sloth is shrinking back and recoiling from the inner movement of the spirit to transform us in the likeness of God. Because what we know is this is true, is that when we make this larger call, and many of you have in this room, Not everybody, I don't know everybody's story, but I can imagine that many of you in this room have made the commitment to be this Christ follower. You've gone to the baptism waters. You've been dead to your old self. You've been come out of those waters as a new creation. And we have a call and a path for our life, and there's no turning back from it. So it might do us well to consider where we find ourselves on this cycle of sloth, acedia. Have I been neglecting this call, this commitment, these practices? And if so, why? And another way, sloth is a sin merely uh, uh, not about laziness, but it's a lack of love. And that lack of love is what lies behind this laziness. And to me, when I think about this sin of sloth, the one thing that came to my mind right away, and I'm sure this is true for many of you, is the year 2020. The year 2020, that was probably the year that for many they fell prey to this sin of sloth and slothful living. They put it on pause, all of it. Reading the Bible, paused. Praying, paused. Serving in my local church, paused. All of it. Then it was forced, right? But now we've been back at it for a couple years now, and some people are still stuck in it and don't have the language to understand what is happening within them. And perhaps it's this particular sin of sloth. And so now we've gotten distracted with things like, of course, like we always will point ourselves because it bears repeating time and time again, but things like social media, that is Definitely a a factor in 
taking us down this path of slothful living. Even the good things, being involved in sports and travel lead, sports and work and working out. I love to work out. I go to title boxing all the time because I like to hit heavy bags, right? And all of that is great. But what's my motivation for why I'm so busy and why I'm doing the things that I'm doing? Am I avoiding something? Am I avoiding the practices I know I ought to be up to? So you say, okay, Patrick, okay, that's wonderful. Not wonderful. You've, that's a lot. What is, what is the antidote? How do we combat this sin of sloth? Well, diligence, devotion, stability of place, stillness, steady commitment, and daily discipline. And you look at this list and you say, well, that's a similar list to how we are antidote for many of the sins. Yeah, absolutely. But it's true for this particular deadly sin too. You know, the word diligence, which means, from Latin, which means to love, diligence is about love and accepting God's love for us and the cost of loving him back. Because, see, we as humans, we are made to love. And to resist love is to deny the essence of our very being. And so to combat this sin of sloth, we need to cultivate these diligent spirits. And I love this idea of stability of place. John Cassian wrote this, and I thought it was so beautiful to help us understand this stability of place. He says, you must not abandon the cell in the time of temptation. Fashioning excuses, seemingly responsible. Rather, you must remain seated inside Exercise perseverance. And the struggle to not succumb to this exiting will lead to a mind that's unskilled and cowardly and evasive. To stay put physically was to mean to stay put spiritually even when one was not spiritually engaged or enthusiastic. Staying put is the antidote to a restless boredom and temptation to leave one's cell, metaphorically speaking. And I love the idea of this spiritually engaged and enthusiasm that is lost sometimes. And many of us have been a part of churches in our past and part of faith communities in our past where it's like, well, you know what? The excitement has gone. I don't feel that engaged. It's time to leave. Now, I don't want to be so black and white about it, but I want us to prayerfully consider what might it look like to get even more rooted in the place that God has placed you. Because the sloth just simply picks up and goes to another place and ends up doing the same slothful thing they were doing in the place they were previously. And it becomes this cycle. Because here's what I know. The enemy wants you to keep exiting the different places that God has placed you. I don't want you committed and stable and, and in one particular place, I want you to be this wanderer. That means we can't succumb to escapism. Staying put with your spiritual disciplines. Diligence is focusing on love and seeking what is best for the people God has put in our care or in our path. And so maybe this particular verse in Galatians will help us. It's from Galatians 2, verse 19 through 20, with some kind of in the end with some Ephesians and Colossians. But hear this. It says, I've been crucified with Christ no longer. I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. 
When God lives in us, the spirit transforms the whole being. The old has gone, the new has come. By the power of the spirit, we have clothed ourselves with a new self, created according to the likeness and in true righteousness and holiness. We are Christians, but in a sense, we're still becoming Christians. It's this idea that I love that we are both, God is both already and not yet fully present in us. That's why I believe that Paul consistently in Scripture encourages us to grow in our faith and become more and more like Christ. Doing the baptism, saying the prayers, it's not a one-time thing. It's something that we do consistently, something we do daily so that we don't fall prey to this sin of sloth. I think one of the passages that I love most that really helps in this way, reminding us of this journey of diligence and devotion, comes from 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 through 7. Here's what it says. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Amen. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Though these has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them we might practice in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And for this very reason, and here's what I love, make every effort, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness, godliness, I cannot talk this morning. And to that mutual affection and mutual affection love. That's the journey for us. It's the making every effort. I love that. I love that phrase. Because saying we know that it's going to be hard. We know that it's going to be struggle. But here we see Peter saying make every effort. Because here's what the slothful person says. It says, I want God to love me, but, and, 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 but being changed by this love is too hard. I want the comfort and security of being loved by God without having to give back and sacrifice anything. Take responsibility or invest myself in relationships over the long haul. In the end, and through the spiritual commitment, make someone of sloth feel grieved, oppressed, and resentful. Now here, I get it. I don't want us to leave here thinking like, man, this is, that's a lot, Pat, that's hard. Yes, we've got to have this balance of grace and discipline. And we've talked about many times in this space about grace and truth, but here I'm talking about grace and discipline. We have to do the things that we're called to do, and that's a discipline, reading scripture, prayer, serving, connecting with each other in this space, and in the spaces that God finds us in, that puts us in. And we have to find that beautiful balance. And it's hard, but it is possible. And perhaps that's something you discuss with the person you came with at lunch or or through your life groups, but we have to find this balance of grace and truth as we try to create this antidote to this slothful living. You say, okay, well, what about practically? What does that look like, especially when it looks to be of stability of place and recommitting myself and coming out of this slothful slumber and really being active in what's happening in the life of the church? And maybe for you, that's, if you're not in a small group, maybe that's joining a small group. Maybe that's going on an international trip to serve. Maybe that's being a, simply being a mentor. And some of you in this room have never mentored anybody 
Friend, what are you waiting on? You old. It's time. <laughs> I don't know, Patrick. I, I don't have anything to tell anybody. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Talk about the things you, you should have did. Talk about the mess ups. But maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to go on a retreat. You're like, a retreat? Do you know how busy I am? Okay, sloth. I'll tell you how busy you are. Participating in the classes that happen. You're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a discipline. Joining one of the ministries that we have. Kids, OCYG, college young adult, men's, women ministry, room in the end. If you, there, when Blake got up here, I was like, there shouldn't be an empty spot by the end of worship today. We should be clamoring to find ways to serve. You say, but I'm just too busy. And we think that that is something that God would have us do is to keep being busy. Yes, we have responsibilities. I'm not saying to leave those responsibilities. But I'm saying, look, family, we, we do not want to find ourselves trapped in this particular sin, which can come for us all when we're not even expecting it. So I want to end this morning with this prayer, and it's kind of a prayer slash confession, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer. So I want you to stand with me, and um, this comes from Thomas Merton and an unknown author to kind of match them up. So let's pray this. Hear these words. Forgive me for letting love die when it demands action in order to live. Unite my hands and deliver me from my heart, deliver my heart from sloth. Set me free from the laziness that goes about disguised as activity when activity is not required of me. And from the cowardness that does what is not demanded in order to escape sacrifice. But give me the strength that waits upon you in silence and peace. And we pray the way you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory.
The young man Samuel found himself all alone. You see, the Israelites' perpetual nemesis, the Philistines, had just attacked and killed the, high, the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons. And then Eli, when he heard about it, he fell over dead by himself. There's no one left. It's just Samuel. And if you study that whole chapter, you'll realize Samuel was probably in his teens when he's all alone. And why are the Philistines successful against attacking Israel? It's because Israel has turned away from God. The first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods but me. Israel is now serving Baals. They're They've got Asherah poles. They've got everything, anything but God first. And that's why God sent the Philistines, used the Philistines to attack them perpetually. Samuel began a 20-year journey where he made a circuit all through uh, the tribe of Benjamin into Ephraim 
preaching repentance. Turn away from these idols. Turn away from all this and bow down to God who brought us out of Egypt. He's the one. So after 20 years, the people relented and they said, okay, Samuel, well, let's do it. Let's, let's redo the covenant that we have with Joshua. So Samuel said, let's all gather at Mizpah and we'll ratify the covenant. It'll be a great thing. So hundreds of thousands of children of Israel gathered at a little town called Mizpah. And as soon as they did, the Philistines heard about it and said, let's go up and attack them. We'll wipe them out. They're all in one place. So Israel had not really been prepared for a battle. They went to ratify a covenant. And the Philistines gathered all around them. And they came to Samuel and they said, Samuel, you've got to pray. Stay constantly on your knees. Pray that the Lord will deliver us, that somehow we'll be delivered from this mob that's going to kill us. Just as the battle was about to start, God caused, and I don't know how it happened, but God caused a great thunder. The thunder was so loud that it subdued the Philistines and the children of Israel went out and captured them and, and destroyed them. And the Lord wrought a great victory on that day. Now, Mo Abraham did it. Moses did it. Jacob did it. Joshua did it. And now Samuel said, let's raise up a stone. And so they took a big rock and they put it, they sat it up and they called it Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. And when you pass by Ebenezer, you're supposed to see that and you're supposed to say to yourself, what happened there? And you teach your children, what happened there? Thus far, God has helped us. Now, I was teaching this last Sunday, and it wasn't nearly as dramatic as this. Um, but I was thinking all week, what have we got that our kids can look at and say, thus far, God has helped us? And I thought about my own developmental stages. And when I was a young man, I used to walk through, walk through the church from the back door, and you would see in the very front of, the, of this church... Every church I've ever been in in my whole life, it had a table in the front. And on it were the elements of the Eucharist, the wine, the bread. And on the front of that table, it said what? This do in remembrance of me. Quoting the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, you know, I remember as a 15-year-old kid thinking, there's not a lot I can do, but I can do that. That, I would tell you, sports fans, is our Ebenezer. That's what we should be remembering and teaching everyone because, yeah, the, they, want, they want a battle. Jesus won the war. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Father, that you ask us to remember, not, not because of you, but because of us. It helps connect us with who we are in your kingdom. Thank you for this bread and this cup. Just pray, Father, that you use us to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.
forever. Oh, my soul, lift up your praise. I will rise and bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. High as the heavens, deep as the sea.
won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out. I might have been able to do that percussion thing. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs>